Nick, my brother, episode 100, you were episode one. This is such a treat to be to have you back. So I was thinking about it earlier. It's a real honor. Thank you, brother. And I'm I'm so impressed that you've that you've just done this, bro. Like I remember when we were talking about it, I said to you, don't be that guy who starts a podcast and does like three episodes and then just like the momentum, just he loses momentum, it just fades away. And you you did it, bro. You stuck it out. A hundred episodes. That's I mean, you're in the top 0.001% of people who start a podcast. Well, I got to say, there were some dark times, like episode 12 or something. I was kind of burnt out. I was busy at work. And I remember thinking, oh, should I just pack this in? And your words, your words echoed in my ears. I was like, nope, I can't. <laughs> so uh, thank, thank <laughs> you for great. that. Nick, you said something real cool now just when we were talking, because one thing I really admire about you is you're such an open book. And you said it's great because this, this, it's not like you can ever get blackmailed or anything because you don't have any secrets because you talk publicly about everything, you know, your failures, your successes. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful way to live because so many people try to pretend to be more than they are. You know, they're, they're renting Lamborghinis for photo shoots to try and pretend they're rich on Instagram or all these different things. I feel like we live in a very superficial world where people pretend they're more than they are. And one thing you've helped me with and this podcast helped me with is it's so refreshing to talk about your failures because I never want people to look at me, say someone starts in real estate and they look at me like, oh, it's okay for Lawrence, you know, he's killing it. He's never had any problems. And I'm like, no, I'll be the first to tell you, you know, I'm in the middle of a lawsuit right now from a guy that screwed me over. I've made some incredibly bad decisions with two different partners that I partnered with. And it's so refreshing just to be open. Like you said, you can look in the mirror and just know that, you know, you don't have these skeletons in the closet. Yeah, it's cool. I, I completely agree. I still hold that, that, uh, perspective. I mean, yeah, th I don't tell everyone everything. Uh, no, you know, there are a few things that like, you know, a man has to keep to himself, but I mean, like generally, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, you, you probably disagree with this. In fact, I'm pretty sure you will, but it's one of the reasons I don't subscribe to the, like, oh, the government's listening to you and big brothers like watching you. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, if I had something to hide, I'd worry about that, but I don't have anything to hide. I pay my taxes. I don't commit any crimes. I'm like, so what if they find out that I watched three episodes of Breaking Bad back to back or whatever it is they're spying? <laughs> like, I don't care. I don't, yeah. Like, like go wild. Like, and I know obviously there's this deep implications in that. And it's, it's a very simplistic way of, of framing it, but like, uh, it is, it is something I've thought about. Nick, you know, what's so interesting about that is, you know, my views on, I'm kind of like a, strong libertarian. I like sm the idea of smaller government. And I realized that I never had those views living in England, but coming to America 21 years ago, it's the, the idea of freedom. It's such an American thing. I feel like people in Europe are much more better behaved. Whereas if the government say, hey, you know, we've got this COVID, we're shutting down, we're locking down. Most people in Europe would be like, okay, you know, the government tells me to. Whereas it's like that American freedom that I've really come to embrace that sense of like, no, you know, we, we started this by rebelling against our government in England, and then we set up mm -hmm. our own our own ruling colonies. So uh, I've I've noticed I've really embraced that change. And one thing I've I've been thinking about recently is it's easy to like if I you know you see those memes about someone writing it writing about how bad capitalism is, drinking their seven dollar coffee on a thousand dollar iPhone, and you think they're yeah. so clueless. You know, if they saw how a lot of the world lived. But it's like, I was the same way, man. I boxed in Cuba when I was 26, I think. I spent a month training out there because I had some of the best amateur boxing in the world. And at the time, my life was like real focusing on competitive boxing. And I, I remember I've got photos of me walking around wearing a Che Guevara shirt. And I didn't think, I, I've never thought I was a socialist, but I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Whereas when I see the pictures now, I cringe. So one thing I'm really trying to be is less um, judgmental on people because people change and you should you should allow, especially young people, you shouldn't allow a young person, you shouldn't expect a young person to have it all figured out and judge them on things. And I think that's one, that's one thing we're seeing now where people, people bring back a tweet they did 10 years ago and they're like, oh, how could you say that? And it's like, man, if you watch a movie from the 80s, you couldn't make that today. Times change, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. You know, um, you know, I, you're one of my favorite humans, uh, really one of my, like me and, and Igor and some of our other friends. I always say to them, you're the best of all of us because you really are such a lovely man. Um, but the one thing, the one ideology that I, I've never been able to agree with you on is, is um, uh, libertarianism. And as, as I get older, more and more, do I think that it is, it is a very deeply flawed ideology in that uh, in theory, 
or even in theory, it's flawed, but in some in some ways, it could be like looked at as as a solution to the problems we're experiencing uh, as a society. Uh, I'm not saying socialism is the answer, but I really do not think that libertarianism is the answer. And um, yeah, it's just something I've always disagreed with you on. Um, however, I do get that people change, and like, yeah, maybe. And what's that expression? People start out as socialists, and then once they've that you you're socialist when you're young and then once you've made your money and you have something to lose you become a capitalist right or you become yeah. a conservative that was it you start as a liberal then you become a conservative mm-hmm. um and I, yeah man i i just uh another th- actually i'm jumping around here there's a lot of things swimming around in my head now but you, you mentioned how uh in in europe uh, people just do what they're told and i think there's a big difference between say for example england and france um I noticed that in England, people are very like uh, they're very much rule followers generally, and they've they have a, a very deep intrinsic fear of the government. And uh, someone said that someone said to me once, the reason for that is because they never killed their king or they never killed their queen, like like they did in France and like they did uh, metaphorically in in the United States with the re- the rebellion right against the the British British rule and. I think there's something to that. And, you know, I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, the United States had a really nice balance of socialism and capitalism or social aspects and capitalistic aspects. But now what's happening is we're very rapidly moving towards what I believe is a capitalistic hellscape in which it's it's just survival of the fittest and dog eat dog. And, you know, there's... I'm all for the a market a market economy, right? I'm all for that. You know, if you, if you don't have that, it turns into. If you look at the Soviet Union, it was a failure. That doesn't work. Communism and Marxism doesn't work. But there are elements of socialism which do work and do improve the quality of lives of the vast majority of people in those countries. A, a statistic I'm very fond of uh, referencing is the fact that, like, the easiest place in the world to get wealthy right now is Scandinavia. And that's because they have social safety nets. So you can take risks and fail and not have to worry about being left on your own. Whereas here in America, man, if you fail, it's it's you, bro. You're on the streets, right? And that's one example, but there's many other. And so I, I'm really interested to know where this ideology was or how, how you came to be a proponent of libertarianism besides the Ayn Rand books, because oh, that's a whole different topic, I guess. Well, brother, uh, slight correction. They did. Um, King Charles was beheaded in. What was he? Civil, okay. Yeah, there was like a there was an English civil war because um, he was he just kept. So at the time, Parliament was kind of growing in strength, and Parliament was supposed to represent the people. And there was this ongoing battle between Parliament and the king. And even after the first civil war, um, they didn't they didn't kill him because they still had so much respect for him, and they they saw the king as as a godly right to rule over the people. And then he was imprisoned and then he got the Scottish, the Scottish and English were, you know, historic enemies. He got those because he, he had some Scottish ancestry as well. So he got the Scots to free him. And then he had a second civil war. And then the, the second time, Oliver Cromwell, who was the head of the army, he, he was just like, no, we're done. But even then, it, it, there was barely anyone that would sign the uh, the warrant to get him to get him um, executed because they were just wow. so scared. Um, and then well, you Oliver never learned. I did not know that. Yeah, he he ruled for about 12 years before his death. And that was an actually an incredible time in English history because he was very, like, very, very tolerant historically. He he wasn't, you know, he, he'd have different religions he was okay with. He just wanted peace in the realm. Um, so mm-hmm. it was actually a very interesting time in human history. I'm a huge mm-hmm. fan of Oliver Cromwell. I actually studied that when I was younger in my history wow. classes. And when I was mentioning uh, there was a Oliver Cromwell statue, and I took Jen to, to London a few years ago, and I had a, I took a photo of it, and I was saying, oh, you know, Oliver Cromwell was a great guy. And one of my one of my Irish friends here, who actually I fought in the Golden Gloves when I was 24, my first ever Golden Gloves match was against this guy, and we're, we're friends now. And he sent me a message, and he, he's Irish, and he's like, "Bro, Oliver Cromwell is a bad man," and that's because the Third Civil War was once the king was beheaded that the Irish uh, colonies were rebelling and he sent the the army over there and they were just ruthless with the Irish rebellion. So because mm-hmm. of that, mm-hmm. like even now, 400 years later, Irish people, you say that name and there's bitterness. It's wild. Like the, 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 wow, bullshit, the that's history. Nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, think so. Thanks for illuminating me. Um, that's but, interesting. But, I didn't know that. But Nick, yeah. I know what you're saying. Um, I'm the, the thing with, the thing with capitalism is, I'm well aware you can't have unbridled capitalism because like, if you look at this thing with um, 
that guy Sam Bankman Fried and the FTX thing. He was so entrenched in politics and he was just such a scumbag. And he's already getting let He, I mean, that guy stole billions of dollars from hardworking people like us. And he's it, it, they keep dropping charges. Like he he might get away with just wild because he's so entrenched in the system. And then you look at these politicians that make, you know, a couple of hundred thousand a year, but they're worth a hundred million because they get all the insider trading tips. And it's disgusting, you know, like I'm not left, I'm not right. I think both sides are so corrupt. I think America is run by like the, you know, military industrial complex behind the scenes. And that's actually one of the reasons that I'm so fond of that um, JFK Jr. Because I think he's the one of the only politicians that talks about stuff like, in order to help the poor Americans, the best thing politicians can do is have a stable currency. And that doesn't, so, because inflation affects the poorest, the worst. All the wealthy people during COVID 2020, all their stock, stock portfolios went up so much. They made so much money. Whereas the poor working class that didn't have anything, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They're seeing their grocery bill go up, their gas bill, their, you know, their rents are going up. So um, it's, I, I definitely, I'm definitely aware of what you're saying. It's a bit more complicated, but I think, I just look at the way the government handled 2020. I feel like that was a real stark thing. I just, they were just so incompetent. And yeah, then I look at- I have to, every, I have to agree with that, yeah. And then I look I at every, every major city in the US is just, it's just getting worse. It's like, it, you know, crime rates are going up, homelessness, mm -hmm. the, the, the problems we have. And I'll tell you something, I'd love to, love to talk to you about this, Nick. I was a huge fan years ago of Sam Harris and he would write about how um, it, it's, the he he's very anti, you know, anti-Islam and just the 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 if you read the Quran, just the, the way they're so combative and they what they want to basically spread Islam by the sword. And he would write all this stuff. And I used to think it's like, yeah, he's got a really good point. And then I heard a podcast, and of all people, it was um that really controversial guy, uh, Andrew Tate. And he was talking mm. about how in Muslim families in England, they're they they all get a house together and they all the, the the family and the extended family and the friends they all live together and they, they kind of they're like a community they save money together they share bills and they become incredibly wealthy as a community and I'm thinking I'm I'm so close minded I always thought like you know Islam is a very bad philosophy but in many ways is actually a really good philosophy for for personal you know building up your wealth and and providing for your families and um, so I'm definitely less. I'm less of an extremist with libertarianism, but but the theory of libertarianism is you have exactly the same things you have now. You have the fire department, you have the police department, but you just, instead of being run by a corrupt bureaucracy, which is the government, it's outsourced to private interests where they're competing against each other. So that the best thing is if you go to the, the Chicago um, uh, Motor Vehicle Bureau to get a new license, it's painfully slow, people are rude. It's it's very, it's just, just um, inefficient. And then you go to a busy Starbucks on a Saturday morning and they're just banging out the coffees. They're polite. Mm -hmm. The line goes good. And it's because one is one has consequences for having good business and one doesn't. And so I think that's the philosophy is the government is just, there's certain things that I think most libertarians think government is needed, like the, the military to protect the borders. But then, I mean, look at, look at America right now. I think this administration, not that Trump was perfect, but I think this administration was voted in because people hated Trump so much. But the thing that's going on in the southern border, I think that they'd be writing about it in 30, 40 years because it's tragic how many people, as a, as a you and I came here legally, we went through the process. But if you think about the amount of like trafficking and, and violence, the poor people coming in the border, criminals coming in, it, the problem is you can't, you can't have a country that gives things to the citizens and then have open borders because then everyone's going to come and there's not enough mm -hmm. money to pay it. I think the problem is, Right now, we're in that state where the American debt is just getting to uncontrollable levels and it's not going to end well. And what infuriates me personally about the, the government now is they're spending the money of my two-year-old two year old son's unborn kids. Like, because the bill is going to come due in, you know, a generation or two. Someone's going to have to pay for it, but they're just spending, spending, spending. So I'm sorry if any of my Ukrainian friends are listening to this, but I think it's crazy that we're sending billion dollars to fund a war in Ukraine when we're broke, you know, we're, we're borrowing money from other countries to fund a proxy war, war with, with Russia and Russia's not the enemy, I don't think. So it's, uh, I mean, that's kind of a, that's a <laughs> we've got that rabbit hole, but, um, but I know what you're saying. I think liberty, yeah, no. you've got to remember as well, Nick, um, the history of when Ayn Rand wrote it, she escaped the Soviet Union and she came to America in the, in the golden age of capitalism. So she was just, her books are, you know, the philosophy behind it is 
she escaped the R Russian Revolution, and then her family, you know, th they stole everything from her family. They were wealthy, and then they, she escaped, and then she sees this opportunity. And I think almost everybody that criticizes the U.S. the U.S. isn't perfect, but they don't realize, like you and I. I don't know if you had a dream to come here. I don't know if I had mm -hmm. a dream, but I, I recognize the opportunity. And if you talk yeah. to people, like I remember in Cuba talking to people and they're like, wow, you live in America. Like that's just the dream. Like they just see it as such a dream. And I think it's so yeah. sad. But when that dream have... is partly this, this dream exists part of all. Oh, God. This dream exists partly because of government, of the fact that America had, when it was created, it had the most, Mm. ingenious progressive form of government that the world has ever seen that's what allowed this thing to flourish mm. right if it had just created another monarchy or another of some sort of marxist socialist republic it, it wouldn't have worked right and mm. another thing i wanted to share with you is that um you know libertarians and anarchists and the conservatives and and again i want to make it very clear I'm not a liberal and I'm not a conservative. I have no dog in that race. I just watch. I just watch some things I find interesting from the one side, others I find interesting from the other side. Um, and one of the things that I I just think is interesting, like everyone's talking about, oh, look how much the government's grown. It's grown. The government's getting bigger. It's getting bigger and bigger. And that's because the population's getting bigger, right? The country is growing. It's obviously it's obvious that the government's going to have grown. It's now 300 and I don't know how many 300 plus million people. It's obviously a way bigger government than it was when there were 30 million people. There's more people to manage. There's more resources to manage. And that's one, one stat or well, little rebuttal I like to throw out there. The other thing that is just an interesting factoid, which you might appreciate, is that Ayn Rand um, was drawing Social Security for the last several years of her life, right? Which really, to me, yeah, I didn't know it either. That's when I heard that, that was a big w wake up call for me. And, and, and another thing that I, I've found out recently, which is, uh, you know, there's this, I don't want to say delusion, but there's this idea that like, yeah, anyone can make it in America and you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say it's completely untrue, but it's a very skewed and polished uh, story, right? You know, what, what happens in, in modern society, especially with the, proliferation of social media is that we are there are these examples of people that rise to the top of the system right and there's only a few of them there's only a few hundred that exist right the elon musks and the jeff bezos and the um, sports stars and everything and you're given these these people and you said yeah, look if you just follow the rules and work hard and use the system to your advantage you can be this guy right but you don't see the other 10,000 dudes who followed all the rules mm. and done that and not made it, right? No one told you about that, right? Mm. And I want to make it clear. I'm the biggest believer in America. I am I cannot wait to get my American citizenship. I love this place. I love it in my bones. I, I was born an American before I even got here, right? But I think that like we've kind of been sold a false bill of goods in some ways. And I'm not advocating for socialism, but like I heard it said once that America is uh, a country of, of temporarily embarrassed millionaires, like people who are just like, you know, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire one day or I should be a millionaire. That's why I'll support whatever the rich and the conservatives decide to do, because I'm going to be one of them one day. And the truth is <laughs> most people aren't, right? And hmm. another truth that I came to understand is a lot of people who built their wealth in this country, it was generational wealth or they used government subsidies or worked the government system to to make their wealth, right? Elon Musk is a great example. That guy milked um, with Tesla. He like milked the government to build Tesla. There's no doubt. It's like it's it's undeniable, right? And again, I'm not saying he's a bad guy or he's not smart or anything. Like it's not as black and white as that. But just like this idea of like, oh, like anyone can do it. Anyone can be the next Jeff Bezos. And if you if you aren't, it's because you're not working hard enough. And it's just not true. It's just not true. Like it's uh, as simple as that. I actually agree with that because um, I, if people are watching this, I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I just came from a charity event with my buddy Sonny, and he's um he's an immigrant from Nigeria, and he's he's a real lovely human, and he just he does all these charity events to help the inner city youth in Chicago. He does sponsor, um, scholarships for the kids, and I do a lot of development and in the worst areas of the city. Basically, if you want to make money as a developer. You go to the the line where it goes from a really bad neighborhood to a changing neighborhood, and you you build right on the line or a few blocks east, you know. 
And um, and I, I talk to the people there and all the time I'm around it. And you see, you see this single mom who's 25 years old and she has four kids with, you know, three different dads that dads aren't around. And you think about those kids don't have the same opportunity that I had when I came here when I was 23, had a master's degree, I was driven, I had a loving upbringing with a, with a nuclear family. So yeah, I'm, I definitely, the older I get, the more I'm aware that that, um, that theory is, is not accurate. The problem, the only problem with the, the idea of people like Andrew Yang that say, Hey, we should have this minimum wage every month. You know, a thousand dollars a month is a thousand dollars a month is very reasonable. But what happens is, and the study of history shows this is that as soon as you start giving handouts, the majority of people are always going to vote for more because they're numerically more than the than the smaller people, the, the wealthy people, like the pyramid. So once you start yeah. down that road, it's a very dangerous thing. So I think the the thing that I'll take from this is you and I both agree it's a very subtle and complex issue. And what one of one of the things that I just hate seeing is people that just see everything as black and white. And like the world is just so subtle and and complex, and it's always yeah. this myriad shade of grays. And it's just so it's so easy. With, with media and social media and your friends and you get in these in these teams against each other but it's like man that I, i'm proud to say nick that i would always say i was a republican leaning libertarian and i've only donated money to one candidate and that was a democrat tulsi gabbard and i would probably donate to rfk jr who's also running as a democrat so i i like to and and obviously i i'm not immune from getting caught up in those tribal games you know when i was living in chicago I would get so upset about the violence because the, the mm -hmm. crime is out of control and the the leadership there just don't seem to that they, they want to just you know tax the people like me that work hard more and they're not doing anything about the crime and i feel so sorry like i'm a former professional fighter with a bunch of guns and i can look after myself but i imagine being a 70 year old widow who lives in chicago and she's just terrified of going out because yeah. it's so dangerous so i really feel for yeah. the weak in the cities and and, and, I mean, and some people would if you take that to its zenith, if you take the, you know, that kind of conservative, minimal government, minimal social uh, systems thing to its logical conclusion, that widow, it's too bad because she mm -hmm. can't like you, the, the logical conclusion is, yeah, go, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, go work harder. You know, mm -hmm. there's every opportunity and, and that it's just, as I said, it's just not the case. But at the same time, I, I also see the other side. I look at cities like San Francisco that have just been destroyed by liberal politics you know they've mm -hmm. just become like borderline unlivable right and mm -hmm. and i and i what i'm learning and it's a very difficult thing to do and our mutual friend rocco taught it to me which is or he inadvertently showed it to me i got sucked into some i hang out with a lot of conservative republican people most of my best friends subscribe to those ideologies and i had gotten sucked into some uh <laughs> debate well it wasn't really a debate but i was i was in, hanging out with them and they were they were talking about some particular topic and i could i didn't see it but rocco noticed that he saw that my perspective had shifted since i'd been hanging out with these people and i was very vocal about it and i was very committed to this particular perspective and rocco said to me he said the matrix has you and i said what do you mean and he said you've fallen into the trap by the trap which is like you, you like the one side or the other, or like the the reds or the blues or the liberals mm. or the conservative, whatever it is, whatever it is today or tomorrow, like mm. wherever it is where you are, right? There's always this kind of us versus them, right? Rocco also says everybody is someone else's them, right? And that mm. that really stuck with me. Everyone is self, someone else's them, right? And and what I've been trying to do as of late is whenever I feel that that uh opinion forming that strong like sense of no this is wrong or this is i immediately say to myself what is the other side and and i try to convince myself of the other side of the argument just as a thought experiment just as an experiment to like work my mental muscle like okay i i look at it i look at this and i subscribe to the the liberal perspective on this particular topic what i'm going to do now is i'm actually going to try to convince myself of the conservative perspective mm -hmm. and just doing that man it's I think it's really healthy and to always realize that at the end of the day, like neither of these people, neither of these groups are your friend. Neither of them have your best interest at heart, right? They're all just caught in their own little matrix and trying to figure out what they want and achieve their objectives. And like, I, I personally think that politics in general is just, I don't want to say it's not, it's, yeah, it's just not something I really involve myself with. You know, I just kind of look at it with a detached, a detached eye because it, 
it's it's quite a dirty affair, isn't it? If we're honest with ourselves, right? Yeah, the, it really the, the is. More you, yeah, the more layers you uncover, just the corruption and just it's just it is gross. It really is gross. But um, well, let, let's leave the politics, Nick. I really want to talk to you about the new things you're doing because I know we talked a bit off air about you taking a break from your podcast, and you said you're you're one of these people that are so in tune with that feeling, like you know, this isn't what I should be doing right now. And a lot of people don't have that gift. They'll stick in a job because they need a paycheck and they'll be miserable for year on year on year. And I always admire you because you have, you lived an incredible life. And, you know, if you think about some of the experiences you've had, you know, you left South Africa, you went to London to follow your jiu-jitsu dream. You trained at the time with the, the GOAT, Hodger Gracie, you got a black belt, you traveled the world, you spent time in Australia and Thailand teaching and just having these incredible experiences. And then you found your way to America. So you've lived this incredible life. and Right now, you still, even though it's harder as you get older, it is harder just to pivot and change. You're doing it right now. You know, you, you, like, I didn't even know you were working on a screenplay, and I know you were just getting that in the last few days. So, like, what happened? I guess what what was this? What was the impetus for this recent change? Uh, you know, a friend of mine who's one of the smartest men I know, super smart guy, he said something to me a long time ago. He said, "In life, you either become a contrarian." Or you become a victim. And what I in in my book, I speak about the one in one of my books, I speak about the law of 180, right? Which is that if you want to achieve, you know, all the heights of the human experience, you always have to look at what the crowd is doing and then turn around and do the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I realized, uh, another way that can be looked at is is the conventional wisdom and the and the the tropes we most commonly hear are very often wrong, not always, but very often wrong. And one of the ones that we've been taught to believe from a very young age is uh, winners never quit, right? Winners never quit. That's, I mean, as far as back as I can remember, I was told that my mom had it written on the fridge when I was a little kid. I remember she, she had it written on the fridge, winners never quit and quitters never win. And I had this understanding and it wasn't my own uh, idea, but I, I listened to a lecture and the, the wisdom was imparted to me through that. And I realized that winners very often quit, right? Mm. Because you don't have time to keep wasting uh, energy. You don't have time or energy to keep wasting on something that doesn't work. Right. And again, it's, it's tied into this, that mistaken belief that, yeah, if you just keep working hard at this project, you're going to be the next Elon Musk. Eventually you'll break through. That's just not true. It's not true. Right. There's a whole confluence of factors that have to all come together and all align for you to achieve success or attain whatever it is you want to attain. Right. And so to me, you have to keep adjusting. You have to keep, and that adjustment relates to the feedback that you're getting from the universe or God or the marketplace or people. And it's also your own internal feedback. If you really hate something and it's a drag and it's making you tired just thinking about it. Yeah, maybe one day if you beat yourself, like if you flagellate yourself for 20 or 30 years, you'll have a breakthrough. Yeah, maybe eventually you'll make it. But fuck it, man. I don't want to waste 20 or 30 years doing that. No way. Like, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but again, as you said, nothing is ever black and white. And it's it's more nuanced than just like, oh, I'm not enjoying this. I'm just going to go do what I love, right? You know, it's it's more nuanced than that. It's, it's like, I'm so, um, I really love that Japanese uh, concept of Ikigai. I've told you about it. I think we've spoken about it before. It's that Venn diagram of the overlap of all these things. It, ikigai means a reason for being, right? So there's all these different uh, circles that are overlapping to form a central central part that's called Ikigai. And that includes uh, what the marketplace needs, what you can be paid for, what you're good at. And there's one other, but like, unless all of those things are lining up, you don't reach Ikigai. So there was a point many years ago, about 20 years ago, where I was offered a job in an investment bank in the city in London. And, you know, like, yeah, I could have made millions and millions of dollars doing that job, but would I have two things? Would I have been happy? Probably not. And secondly, I might not have made those millions and millions of dollars because I just would have felt like crap the whole time. And that would have degraded my performance. And you know what I mean? So like, yeah. it's, uh, I'm so, I'm not I'm rambling a little bit because uh, I'm not no, the sharpest right now. It's it's been a long day, but I, I think you understand what I'm saying. Right, like 
to, to sum things up into little sound bites, especially something as important as your life's vocation and life's work. And mm -hmm. to just say, Oh, just winners never quit. Right. So just keep going. Like mm -hmm. to me, that's overly simplistic and very often inaccurate and has led to a lot of broken dreams. Well, I think in, in a bad relationship, one thing I've noticed with a lot of my friends who are pretty successful on paper, you know, that make good money, had good careers, good educations, they get in these bad relationships and they stay in them way too long. And that's a perfect example of them trying to see it like a company, like I've got to keep going. I've got to keep trying to force this square peg in a round hole. And I was in that before I met. Some cost um, fallacy. Yes. Well, and I, before I met my wife, I remember I was, I was 37 and I was in this terrible toxic relationship. And one of my English buddies said, Lawrence, he said, bro, square peg, round hole. What are you doing? It was so like, I was like, oh my God, he's so right. I'm trying to force this. We're so incompatible on every level. Like, what am I doing? And um, that's one of the hardest things for winners to realize is like what to quit and what to keep fighting. And like that, yeah. there's incredible wisdom there because yeah. you're a winner if you know how to cut your losses quickly. And and the way to do that, it's a, the way to develop that skill, like everything else, the, the most important knowledge you can acquire is self-knowledge, Right. Most people, and I, I'm not speaking from my horse because for the largest portion of my life, I live like this. Most people are so dead to who they are and their feelings and, and what's going on inside them that they don't pay attention to the subtle signals or that tiny voice that's always trying to guide you the right way. And I notice the more quiet I become, the less television I watch, the more I meditate, the more I pray, the more I spend time in nature. And generally, the more that beacon, the easier it is to follow those those beacons, right? And the, the easier it is to realize when I've got to cut something or when I've got to push, right? Like, for example, that screenplay thing, you know, it was tough, right? I just, I just wrote, you know, I just wrote a screenplay for those listening. It, it was, it's been six months. It's been really, it's been really difficult at times, right? And there were times when I was like, wow, this is maybe too hard or maybe I'm, maybe this is the wrong thing. And then I just listened to the voice and I looked at it very, I really reflected on it and realized I was having so much fun doing it and, and it was flowing while I was doing it. And it was just, I could, you know, I, I made a decision or I made a calculation enough or I followed my instincts, however you want to describe it, but, but it was the right thing. It was ultimately the right thing. And even if nothing never ever came of it, it would still have been the right thing because I was in a real flow state for that six months or whenever I was doing it during that six months. And uh, the only reason I could do that is because, I mean, if, if I tried that five or six years ago, two thing, one of two things would have happened. I would have either quit early because my will was very weak mm -hmm. or um, I would have, uh, what was the other thing? Sorry, I, I'd lost my, my train of thought, but like, oh, I wouldn't have realized how much fun I was having because I wouldn't have been mm -hmm. in touch with, with what I was. Voice. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have listened to that voice, you know, but. Now I've managed to overcome those two things. I managed to marshal my will because I've developed it and not quit and also listen to the voice. But if there'd been a voice that had been saying to me, wow, this is terrible. It's not you. Don't do this. I would have listened, right? Well, one thing I've really, really changed my mind on, I've, I've really just, um, has really been an impact for you. you know, if someone says to you, like, what if you changed or what's new in your life recently? I got this uh, plunge pool, Nick, where I, I do the ice plunge in the morning. And I did it because it's it's the fad mm -hmm. and it's supposed to have all these health benefits. And I was like, oh, I've got a basement gym. I've always wanted one. And I used to, when I was fighting, I do a lot of ice baths and I haven't done them for many years. I got kind of soft in my middle age and I hate the cold and I hate mornings. So I was like, this is the perfect thing. You know, the first thing I wake up, I check my phone. I've got a couple of work emergencies. I have a glass of water and I jump in that thing for a few minutes. And it's been so amazing, but not for any of the reasons that they say or the health benefits and stuff. The most amazing thing, Nick, is I do it more than once a day. So sometimes I do it twice. Like today, I did it this morning and I went for a really hot run this afternoon and I had to cool down because I had to get this charity event and stop sweating. So I just jumped back in for a few minutes. And the amazing, here's my realization, Nick. When I'm in that thing, I do three minutes and the, it's so cold that when you first get in, it literally takes your breath away. You're, ah, you know, like it's, it does shock your system. And then that three minutes, you're, you're kind of miserable, but it goes so quickly. And I, it's given me a whole new appreciation of time because I'm like, okay, this three minutes feels like a click of your fingers, 
And that's you being miserable. And we know that when you have fun, hours pass, you know, and it's just given me such a new appreciation of time. Like, Jesus, we're at that age now. We're in our early 40s where I feel like if you look at a lot of great figures in history, some of the most productive, best decades are 40 to 60, those those two decades. And, you know, you and I prioritize our health. Hopefully we can stretch that out a bit. But it's given me such an appreciation of time that I'm just so much more grateful um, for everything. I'm like, I, I don't want to waste that's a day. Cool. Like, yeah. you, you know, I have a shitty business deal, deal deal that I've been working on that falls through and a shitty afternoon with work. I'm like, I can't let this ruin my night because I'm only going to get this one night with Victor. Tomorrow is going to be a day older and a day closer to leaving home. And it's just, it's been mm-hmm. incredible. It's like, it's so cool when you get a weird benefit from something you never expected. Um, yes. No, I, wanted to, I, I just was thinking about that today. That's I was really like, cool. I got to tell Nick about this. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, you know, I've kind of, I, I've done a little bit of cold therapy every now and then. And I'm not I'm not adverse to it, but like it's one of those things that like I guess I've become such a contrarian. Like I just I I mm. am there is a resistance to it because it's the fad now. Yeah. You know, and I've seen I'm sure you you're the same. Like I've seen enough hype now. I've seen enough hype cycles happen now over the course of my life that like mm. I just my default is don't believe the hype. We saw it mm. with the first one I remember was, was Y2K, you know, planes are going to fall out of the sky and it's going to be Armageddon. That was the first one. Then it was the end of the Mayan calendar. You know, then it was, I can't remember the next one, but then it was COVID. Now it's inflation. Like this, this, I just, I've really learned to just tune out the hype and the noise of the world and society and the media. It's I haven't done it completely, but I'm getting better at it. And it's just the more I do that, the happier I am. Man, I remember when I was talking about something with the debt, the uh, the debt growing in America, and I'm like, Dad, you know, that the American dollar is eventually going to default. And he said, Lawrence, they were saying that when I was your age, you know. And then he said, When I was man, your dad. Yeah. Then I said something about worrying when I when Victor was born. I was like, you know, it's kind of scary raising a kid in this environment. And he said, Lawrence, when you were born, we thought we were in the middle of the Cold War. We thought we were going to have, you know, pe- my friends were building bomb shelters for a nuclear fallout in the garden. Like, there's always something, like you said. And <laughs> it, you're right. The, those things you can't yeah. control. It's like, what is the point of worrying about them, right? It's, it's yeah, it's a lot of wasted energy. And that's, 100%, dude. Well, one thing I've learned from you, Nick, dude. The world, like I always say, the, 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 world is, the world has been ending since the world, is, since the world began. There's always been someone calling, crying about how the sky is falling. Always, 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 always. It's the story as old as time. And I realized if it falls, yeah, I mean, that's the end. Like, there's no guarantee that it's going to keep going. There's no guarantee that the the sun's going to come up tomorrow. There's no guarantee that the US dollar is going to maintain its value. There's no, there's no guarantees, man. And I'm just like, okay, there's certain things I can control and certain things I can't control. Inflation is something I cannot control, so I just don't worry about. It. I just do not worry about. It. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to mitigate the effects of it, but I can't control it. Um, yeah, and that's just where I'm now. Yeah, um, that's that's one thing as as a as a new dad is trying to think how can I prepare my son for the future, and I'm I've got a real nice philosophy that. I don't know what the future is because anyone that predicts the future historically has a horrible track record of it, but I can teach him just to have resilience. <laughs> and, and and that's the best thing. And it's the same with us, right? We don't know the future, but if there's going to be an asteroid that's going to hit the earth in nine years and that's going to be the end of humanity, worrying about it won't help. So we might as well enjoy the next nine years 100%. we have. And likewise, with the uncertain future, 100%. you can't prepare for something you don't know is going to happen, but you can just have the mindset that whatever's hap- whatever's going to happen, I'm going to figure it out. And that's a really nice place to be where you just like, you don't have the answers, but you're willing to embrace, embrace the chaos. Um, Nick, you, I think you, you had an awesome rolled up episode with our mutual friend, Jake. Um, it was real cool. I, I, I was uh, oh, yeah. listening to it. It brought back a lot of memories because he's, he took a, he took a bit of a break from those. I used to love watching those. And, uh, he's, he, you know, I think you were the first yeah. one back, which was, which was really, really cool. But one thing you said, Nick, is you said, seems like you changed your mind a little bit on psychedelics. And, um, I wanted to ask you about that because I've only had so many positive, um, benefits from that. And I want to tell the story quickly about when we first met. So we met in Zanzibar. You were doing a jiu-jitsu camp with uh, Nick, with uh, Kid Dale as well, the two of you. And I had already read your uh, Black Belt Blueprint book, and I, I liked your philosophy. I thought you were a real cool guy. 
And I don't know if you remember, but the first few days you were a little, you you were you were all nice, but you were a little aloof. You would kind of do your own thing. Whereas Kit being Kit was always like uh, having lunch with us and joking around and being very jovial. And you would you would be very nice, but you would kind of go off and just spend time by yourself. And then the last night, we hadn't really had any deep, deep conversations. And you, you said to me, you said, bro, I'm going to show you something. And we went out in the water where there was that cool structure about waist deep in water, a couple of stories, this wooden structure. And we climbed up to the top and the stars were out. It was just the most peaceful, beautiful place. And I remember I had asked you because you you were one of the few people that I'd heard on podcasts talking about ayahuasca and psychedelics. And I was always curious. I was like, is there something that, like, I don't think I need it, but I want to know if there's something I'm missing in my life. And I was like, oh, you know, I'd love to do that. You know, how do I go about it? Do I have to go to Peru? And you just said, don't worry, bro, I've got you. And then a couple of years <laughs> later, you sent me an email and you said, I'm putting this men's group together in, in Joshua Tree and we did it. And for me, it was so good to do it because I had those questions like, what am I missing? Is it going to be this thing where I've been working so hard to achieve something, but I've been going the wrong direction? Is it going to, am I going to have a massive, re, re, you know, recalibration of my life? And what I got from it was just, kind of what we're saying about time. Like I really got that impression that you've got to enjoy every day. And it just gave me a lot of perspective. It's almost like, obviously you can't describe it, but what the one image I got a lot was seeing myself from like three or four meters above me, looking down on me and just seeing like all the, like look at the blessings in your life, you know, appreciate the blessings, appreciate what you have at the time. I think it was my girlfriend who's now my wife, but appreciate her and appreciate your friends and appreciate the good things. And that's one thing I love about you is so many people get caught up in things like status, money, prestige, but at the end of your life, all of that stuff is going to be irrelevant. The only thing that matters at the end of the life is the people you spend time with, the people, you know, the people you cared about, the, the beautiful moments you share, the positive energy you put out in the world. And um, so it gave me, that was the reflection that I got. But I know, you know, you've talked about it so much, you know, you, you were one of the, almost like a pioneer in bringing ayahuasca and psychedelics to, to the to the masses, but you've kind of changed your mind a little bit. So I was fascinated to know why, because you, you kind of touched on it, but you didn't speak too much about it. Yeah, dude, I wouldn't say I've changed my mind. I still think that, that it's, I mean, that medicine is like incredibly powerful. It's a, it's a gift to the world. Like I just reached a point where I realized that it, it was time for me to take a break, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I had a very, very difficult experience, um, on November 5th last year. It was, it was the hardest psychedelic experience I've ever had. Like, uh, I don't want to go into the details now, but it, it, it basically, uh, you know, that one of the messages I got was you had the perfect life and you ruined it because of this. Like you just ruined your life. And uh, I almost did ruin my life that night. That's that's the truth. I almost did ruin my life uh, because of what happened. And it just gave me this clear understanding that like, I don't want to say I'm never going to do that again, but it just, it just said like, you don't need that anymore. You don't need this. You don't, you don't need to be exploring those spaces and using this thing for the purposes that you've used it for there's other ways to do it for you now. And, and the way that I've actually found is, is, is through prayer and, and meditation, you know, like um, I found myself coming back to God uh, a lot over the last year. And, you know, the connection that I need and the help that I need, it isn't necessarily through those things anymore. It's through, it's through God. Right. I realized the the big takeaway was like, I was trying to do everything in life on my own. I was trying to figure it out on my own and it, yeah, I've just realized that's not the way, at least for me anymore. It's not the way like God, God helps me now. He, he guides me. He's always been there looking after me. He was there that night. It's only by the grace of God that I'm still alive after that night, but I got a very clear message. Okay. No more fucking around. Right? Like, um, and, uh, I still think those, those, two, those, plant medicines and psychedelics are very powerful tools and they, they can help people in ways that few other things can. But, uh, I have this tendency. It's one of my flaws as a human being is that I, I go all in on things. You know, I don't, I don't do things by half measures and I kind of become a little bit naive and idealistic. Uh, when it, when I explore things, especially if I enjoy them or if I have results with them. 
And then what happens is I start to evangelize them and become almost blind to their limitations or their, their potential pitfalls. And I'm now realizing, you know, like those things do have pitfalls. You know, there's a lot of people who get lost down the rabbit hole of psychedelics. I came very close to being lost on that rabbit hole. And again, the Bible says you shall know a tree or you shall know a tree by its fruits. And I think for me, I was just looking at, at psychedelics and I just realized that it hit a point where there wasn't any further benefit like my life wasn't getting better when i was using them like it was in the beginning like the first few years things were getting better i was learning more about myself i was letting go of things and then the last couple of years it, they just weren't serving me anymore like things things weren't progressing like and i took that again self-knowledge i took that as a feedback mechanism that okay this need, need a break from this thing right time to hmm. focus on something else you said before, Nick, life is a spiritual trip. Do you still do you still believe that? A thousand percent, dude. A thousand percent. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. A thousand percent believe that. Mm -hmm. So, because you said, I think you used the metaphor of jujitsu being a great vehicle to understand the body. Um, but can, the, the like, spirit as well. The spirit and the mind as well, right? Like, oh, I guess that's spirit, I, the samurai. Yeah. Well, no, just like, you know, yeah, the, the spirit, like, you know, you look, I remember when I was going through my divorce, right? I don't want to talk about the divorce section of, section of my life too much, but just it's an example, right? Like my spirit was crushed. My spirit was broken, right? And on the jiu-jitsu map, my jiu-jitsu was shit. I mean, when I could get to the map, the day I could actually get there, performance was terrible because like I had no spirit, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, jiu-jitsu is like, it's very much about, to me, it's about refining your spirit, refining your ego. You know, anyone can be a tough guy in when you're young, take enough steroids and train hard enough and you can be pretty tough, you know, but like, what kind of human are you? I look at, I look at some of the, the current crop of MMA guys and even some of the grappling guys and they're just not the kind of person I ever want to be. I admire their skills and to be brutally honest, I envy their skills. But I do not envy their their characters and their their spirits at all, at all. And I have no interest in being like that. So I don't know if does that answer your question? Yeah, that there was um there was a recent I think it was uh Charles Oliveira's last fight, Benil Derriouche. I like both those guys. And it was so beautiful. Charles gets in the ring and he goes like normally, sometimes you shake your opponent's hand before the ref even brings them together. But he went and shook Darius's hand. And then he went to his three coaches and gave them all a hug. It was just like, it, he's got such a beautiful like spirit. You can see, see such a great fighter that he can turn it on and turn yeah. it off. But he seems like such a beautiful human. And it's so nice to see these savages with that personality because so many of them don't. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. They're just, they're, I also yeah, envy yeah, their this... physicality, but they don't have the spirit, that, that beautiful um, spirit. Yeah, dude. The, the 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 progenitor of that to me was George St. Pierre. Mm. He was the guy who like set the standard for like a martial artist in mixed martial arts. You know, never bad mouth people, never never even I I don't remember him swearing that much even. I, I don't know. I haven't watched all of the interview, so. but but just a good just a good guy, right? Just a good, mm. a good solid dude. I met him a couple of times and he was just a good dude. And then, you know, you have these other guys who are like, you know who they are. They're just you can tell they're always coked up and no doubt that they're cheating on their wives or girlfriends and they're just mud rucking and like just creating drama and chaos and getting pulled over for DUIs. And look, no one's perfect. I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but generally you can look at someone's life and tell like, are they on a good path or a negative path? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not rocket science. Right. And to me, it's the guy, like, I, I'm trying to be on a good path, right? I'm yeah. working my way over to the good path. And so I I want to follow the guys on the good path. I don't want to follow the guys on the bad path. You, you have two, if anyone's listening to this that hasn't seen them, and they do jiu-jitsu, they have to watch them. It's the soul of jiu-jitsu and the spirit of jiu-jitsu on YouTube, your two videos. They are so awesome. I've, I've seen both many times. Um, I think they've got, like, you know, millions of views. I mean, they're, they're so, so popular. They're so awesome. And in one of them, you said something, you had the analogy of, um, 
you're making that perfect sword, but you know, as you get older, one day it's going to break, but today is not that day. And um, you and I are both in our forties and we put, we put our body through hell, you know, the last few decades, it, does it depress yeah. you when you, when you go, you go and you've got these, I mean, I, I'm training at two gyms of my old gym in the city. And I have a gym here in Indiana. The guys are really nice. I really like the guys. And I was rolling with this kid who was 17 years old and he's a blue belt and he's a wrestler. And he was giving me fits. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, this is depressing. I mean, the guy's a monster, but still it's just, it's the, the reality of, of getting old. And it's so starkly apparent when you roll with these super young athletic studs on the mat. Does, mm -hmm. does that get you down? Or like, I, I want to be more philosophical about it. And I, I'm well aware, I, had, I heard this beautiful saying by um, another black belt who I'm actually going to connect you with, uh, my friend Nick Lemania. He's a great guy. I'd be meaning to get you guys in touch because you'll love him and he wants you on his podcast. But he said that when he goes to, to the Jiu-Jitsu mat, he's a Matt Sarah black belt. He trained with all those guys, all you know, people like Aljamain Sterling, world champions. And he says, every time I go to the gym, I know I'm not the best on the mat and I know I'm not the worst and I'm okay with that. And so I'm trying to have that philosophical Thing where I, I'm, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle now. Even if I'm teaching one of my classes, there's going to be guys there that are probably better than me, younger than me, stronger than me. But there's something that it, I want to be more philosophical about it. But it does kind of get me get me down a little bit. Um, does, does that bother you too? Yeah, bro. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm at the point now where I don't even train with those guys because it just costs me too much. Like a, it hurts my back too much yeah. to spar with a guy like a, at that intensity. Um, and yeah, dude, you just long, you long for the days where you could do three training sessions in a row and spring out of bed the next morning. Like, I mean, of course, bro, I, <laughs> I long for that. But I also know it's, you know, the example I always use is Roger's dad, Mauricio, who you met one time, right? Yeah. Mauricio's dad walks into the academy and everyone loves him. Almost everyone loves him. Everyone has respect for him. He always brings a good vibe. The, the level raises when he walks in. Everyone just loves having him on the mat. And the guy's like 68 years old or something. Like he, he's not going to like beat everyone up. I mean, he's, he's a tough, tough son of a bitch, right? Like I want to make it clear. He's tough. Like, but you know, he, he can't hang with those dudes. Hmm. And to me that like, that's, I want to be the guy that people know. Okay. When, when I'm talking to him, he's listening to me. Right. He makes me feel good when, when I'm around. He's, he's got a good vibe. He cares. He's a good teacher. You know, like there's so much more to it. There's, there's so many, it's like, it's like, um, you know, Trump's cards. I'm sure you played with them when you were a kid in England, those Trump's cards. Mm. Top, top Trump's, what they're called top, top Trump's. Yeah. Top yeah. 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 So like basically for those, <laughs> for the vast majority of people listening to this, who can't understand that reference because they didn't grow up in a British colony or England in the uh 80s the 80s uh it's this card game where yeah where you have these cards that like there'll be one pack that'll be like i don't know um motorbikes and your friend gets half the pack and you get half the pack and each each card is a different motorbike and each motorbike has a different level of stats and you kind of like play your card against your buddy's card right and whoever stats win on average wins out and i realized like your prowess as your, or your 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 combat prowess in jiu-jitsu is only one of those stat bars. It's just one, mm. right? And I don't even think it's the best one anymore. I used to. I used to think that that was it. Bro. Like, I don't like as long as I'm good at that. Like, and now I've realized. And 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 I'll be honest with you. It's not just because it's waned a lot and it's still continuing to wane for me. It's because I've realized that it really isn't the best one. It just isn't, right? Like who you are, the energy you bring, your contentment, your kindness, your heart, your ability to teach, your ability to help, those things are all to me way more important stats. And I know that those stats are continuing to grow for me. So for me as a trade-off, I'll take that any day of the week. Brother, I just got some incredible flashback memories of playing trump cards with some of my friends as a kid. Wow. It's so powerful. <laughs> we were talking a bit before yeah. we started recording and it's so true, Nick. It's like, you can have these memories that are buried in you. And if you would, we hadn't had this conversation, I would have never, I'm sure I would have gone to my grave. I would never have accessed those memories. But now I just get, they all come flooding back. I'm eight years old again, playing with my neighbor. <laughs> That's so that's wild. Cool. 
what you said is so true. The one thing I love about you, Nick, is I remember when you were kite surfing in Zanzibar and you were really good. And I'm like, holy shit, brother, you're amazing. And you're like, yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a two stripe purple belt or so. You you were like, you know, I'm not a black belt level, but I, I'm I'm decent. And you have that reference. And I always say that to people um, at the gym. I'm like, listen, like you're a purple in jujitsu, but you're a black belt human. You're a black belt in life. The way you work really hard. You have your family. You have two young kids. You live an hour away from the gym. You work nights and you still drag yourself in for the new class, exhausted. You still get in. I have so much respect for those people. So I know exactly what you what you, what you mean about that. there's more to life than just being that savage. But um, I still can't help missing it. And one thing I've been struggling with is I've been competitive for 20 plus years, whether it was boxing, jiu-jitsu, MMA, all these different things. And this is the first year, 2023, that I said, I'm getting some stem cells in my neck and back. I've got all this, you know, my neck is jacked up. I've got bulging discs. I've got all these issues. And I was moving to a new state. I've got a lot going on. I'm like, I'm just going to take a break from everything. And I've noticed I'm still working out. I try and do something every day, but I've noticed that lack of goals has made me a little bit down. And I do like, I do like the striving, like, oh, I'm going to run this marathon in three months. I've got to know I've, every Saturday I'm doing longer runs to build up something. I like that, that process. And I'm feeling, just feeling a little bit, I don't want to say unhappy, but I'm, I'm just feeling like there's something missing, but it doesn't mean that I want to keep competing in jujitsu because I'm a little worried about, you know, 44, I want to be playing with my son when I'm in my 50s. I don't want to destroy my body. But I just, I really, I got to the stage with jujitsu where for me, it was never about the opponent or competing, win or lose. It was the the journey. And, and I think GSP said this too. He loved, he hated fighting, but he loved the process of, okay, I've got a fight booked in 12 weeks. I'm going to go to this gym. I'm going to work on these skills. I'm going to go to this gym. He loved the intellectual challenge of the preparation. And I realized that it's exactly the same for me. Even back when I was fighting, I hated fighting. I didn't have any, I remember just before going into one of my MMA fights, seeing this raw jacked, tattooed up guy. And I'm like, oh shit, I was just getting Vaseline on my face. I'm kind of looking up at him in the cage. I'm like, man, he looks like a real scary guy. I haven't got any problem with this guy. I don't want to fight this guy. What's he ever done to me? It's, it's the opposite of when you have like a road rage incident and you're like, oh, I want to yeah. fight this guy. I was like, I got a problem with this guy. And so that, that was always my philosophy. But I just, I hate that feeling that I've got. Did you win that fight? Philip Anderson. I did actually, yeah. I got on bar first round. Yeah. He, he was he was a really, he, you know, it's so funny. Nick? He was a really good boxer. He had some professional boxing fights. Um, I, but I, I didn't think his grappling was too good. And two weeks before, I, I felt so bad. Two weeks before, I was at a, a local jiu-jitsu tournament. I think I was a, a purple belt at the time. I was a, a close to brown belt. And I remember hearing his name called. And it was a white belt division. And I remember thinking, oh boy, this guy's oh, wow. in trouble. <laughs> so so I, I thought his grappling was you know, maybe like a solid blue belt or something. I was like, oh, this guy's going to be in trouble. But uh, yeah, that, that was a bit of a mismatch. But that, that <laughs> feeling of... That feeling, Nick, of being um, a little, like when, when you don't compete, I, I find it harder to keep the motivation. I feel like I'm really motivated when I have something I'm striving for. Mm. And I hate that feeling of, I feel a bit un unanchored. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same, especially with, with jiu-jitsu. It's very hard to get motivated if you don't have a competition or like uh, like a, a belt that you're chasing or whatever it might be. I, I completely understand, man. But it's to me, you seem like the kind of guy who's got, are oh, you talking about just specifically within a jujitsu context or you know, no, like even, in general? Yeah. Like I was thinking like, do I want to sign up for like a 50 mile run or something? Because I feel like the, I, I just like the idea of, I really like the idea of ultra marathoners because they're so miserable and it takes you to yeah. a place like it's, you're in so much physical pain that it almost takes you to a spiritual level in your mind. And I know people like David Goggins have talked about that. And I've noticed it with myself where, it's almost like you get to that stage where you're tired and sore and then you get through it. And it's almost, it's almost like a psychedelic experience. It's, it's really wild. Mm -hmm. So I'm like the most I've ever run is the, is a 35 mile race in, in your hometown, two oceans, um, marathon nice. in Cape Town. And I would love to do like, you know, a 50 mile run. But then today I went for a four mile run in the heat and I was like, man, that was hard. I was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> 50 miles. You know? So I guess I just, that, that idea of, of, you know, you were so, like you said, you were living for jiu-jitsu at the time. You got your black belt super quickly. You were, you were an absolute monster. Um, but the fact that you're still putting your gear on and teaching and helping, it's incredible, right? You've been doing it so long. And we all feel really sorry for those people who 
we know love jujitsu and they got to blue belt and then they meet a girl and they quit training and they get out of shape. And you always, you see, you see that all the time in these jujitsu academies. And you always, you, it's almost like, you know, that they would be happier if they kept the discipline going. But at the same time, one thing that I love about you is I remember you talking about this before where you said in traditional martial arts, you see these guys who are like these vibrant 60 and 70 year olds, you know, doing punches and kicks and carters and they just look vibrant. And then you see a 40, 40 year old jiu-jitsu guy who can't even stand up straight. His back's so <laughs> bent and his knees, he's, he's limping because his knees, he's had all these knee surgeries and his hips are tight and his fingers are like claws. He can't straighten his arms like me because his elbows are so jacked. And, and I think yeah. about that too. You know, I think about how much of your body do you want to give to this sport? Yeah. And for me, there's like a ratio of, uh, there's so much to be said on this, but I, I realized like hard sparring, I can do it a couple of times a month and um, maybe three times a month. And I yoga, I, I started yoga training seriously. Again, I took a long break for, I would always dabble and, and still stretch and do a little bit of yoga in my spare time, but I wasn't going to any classes. And I started again about six, seven weeks ago because I was having this back issue that wasn't getting better. And it, my God, it made it, su it's made such a difference to my back. I can't even, it, my back is 95% better now. Um, and so to me, like sparring is now not the core of my jujitsu. For most people, that's the core. It's like, I'm going to go get some rolls in and I'll do six rounds a day or whatever. Yeah, man. Now, if I, if I do six rounds a week, honestly, no exaggeration. If I do six rounds a week, it's a lot really like that's, that's probably about as many rounds as I do a week, but man, I'm always stretching. I'm always doing yoga. I'm always practicing. I'm always teaching. I'm always watching. I'm always, you know what I mean? Like you don't, it's there's different seasons in your jujitsu career. And yeah. I realized that that season of like, just beating my body and putting it through the ringer, it's done. And I'm not going to buy into the bullshit story of like, Oh, you're not, doing jujitsu unless you're getting beat up and broken all the time. It's a delusion. It's like a little, it's, it's generally rooted in fear, right? Like it's this fear of like, Oh man, if I'm not training all the time, I'm not I'm like, I used to live my life by this saying, if you're not training, somebody else is training to fuck you up. That, that was how fucking stupid I was when I was younger. I used to believe that. And you know, a lot of jujitsu guys, they, they only, they only push their bodies that hard, not because they love it. They do it because they're afraid. And they think it's some sort of badge of man, of like manhood. And it's not, it's just unintelligent, right? To just push yourself to the point where your body's broken. Because when your body's broken, you sure as hell not going to be able to do any jujitsu, yeah. right? Like, and that's not intelligent, right? So to me, and again, it comes back to ego. I have to constantly, there's times when I'm like, there's a guy and I want to, <laughs> might be a bit of a douchebag or I want to test myself against them. But I know like, if I, if I do it, I'm going to pay the price. Right, I'm going to be limping, and I just have to accept. Okay, I can't hang with that guy. I can't. There's a, we've got this brown belt kid in our gym. Can't hang with him. I just can't. I can't. I can't fight with that guy anymore. He's too good. He's too big. He's too strong. He's too technical. It's just I'm just not on that level anymore. And it was hard for me to accept. It, but I always knew that day was coming, and I was like, okay, well, that day's here, you know. And every every guy hits that day. Every yeah. single every guy hits that day, and it's yeah. you just got to accept it, right? Like. What am I going to do? Like, just keep pretending I'm 22 years old. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, yeah. On, on the positive, what we were talking about, it's kind of hard to accept that. But on the positive side, it's like, you, you, if you're doing the same thing at 42 that you're doing at 22, it's kind of sad too. You know, like you want to be evolving and, and growing and changing. Um, I know you've talked about like you with, with Hodger Gracie, you had, um, you always had a good relationship with him, but you said there was always a bit of distance between you when you were when you were training with him when you were younger. And now the relationship's a bit warmer. But is that someone? Obviously, at the time, I'm sure you looked up to him so much, and and seems you know he he seems like one of those guys like a GSP where he just seems like he's just he's a black belt human as well as a, a jujitsu champion. Do you still look up to him a lot? Yeah, I I really. <laughs> He's just I'm smiling now. Always, whenever I think of Roger, I just get a smile on my face because he's just a cool guy. He's just, he's fun and easy to be around. And he's just, he's got such a nice nature, man. Like he's, mm. he's just such a cool dude. And he's, look, he's not a perfect human, right? Like, like all the rest of us, he's got his flaws and his vices and like, but generally he's just such a cool guy to be around. I remember a story I'm fond of telling, which is my main training partner, one of my main training partners at the, the London Academy was this um, Angolan guy called Alio. Uh, and the one time 
he injured his knee really badly and he didn't have health insurance or anything. And this was before Rogers had a big academy and he, he didn't have a lot of money and, and Rogers paid for his knee surgery. And that like, when I, I remember no, no one, uh, that wasn't a story that anyone knew. It, it like came to me like, uh, privately through, through Alio, uh, one step removed from Alio. So I knew it wasn't something that Roger wanted like advertised. And I remember hearing that and I was like, wow, like what a, what an excellent human being, you know? Uh, and that's, yeah, that's the thing with Roger. Like a lot of Brazilians, especially Brazilians, uh, but a lot of martial uh, jiu-jitsu instructors and school owners and stuff, they very territorial and they don't have great morals and they're kind of douchey, bro. That's the truth. They're just like, just generally not very nice people. Not all of them. I'm not like, but a lot of them are right. More than you'd think. And Roger doesn't have any of that, man. He's generous and he's cool. And he's, and once someone said this to me the other day, he said, he's like that. Cause he's at the top of the food chain. He doesn't, he yeah. doesn't care. He doesn't care what everyone else is doing. He's, he knows what he can do. He knows what he's done. He knows who he is. And uh, I, I admire that a lot about him amongst other things. Right. Do you, do you have certain people that you really admire and look up to or, or not really? Cause I know what you said about, you know, no one's perfect, right? Hodger included. Yeah. There, there's wonderful people, but everyone's got their flaws. Do you, do you still look up to individuals or, or not yeah. so much as you can? Yeah. You, you're one of them, bro. You're one of them. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking. You're one of them. There, I have never met someone with a, a purer spirit. Not once in my life. Have I ever met a human being with a purer spirit than yours? Like, the reason I remember once you went to do ayahuasca, we were doing ayahuasca. I think, I think it was your second time, and it just you got the message. Oh, I just got to go home and be with my family. So you left and you didn't stay for the second night. And the reason for that is because you don't have any big issues, bro. You you just generally happy and healthy and a good guy. With and and yeah, dude. So I really look up to you for that. I, I truly, truly do. And yeah, I look up to many people, but I don't worship anyone, bro. And I don't ever put anyone on a pedestal anymore because I realize that that is. It's just not the right way to move through life, in my opinion, to pedestalize people. No, I agree. Nick, well, thank you for being so sweet and saying that. But I remember feeling so guilty because um, I went off and I sat by myself and one of the guides came up to me and he's like, you know, we're supposed to all stay together, but you seem like you're pretty happy. So I'm just going to let you be. And I said, okay. And I remember sitting there and that ex-girlfriend I had with that very toxic relationship I suddenly felt a lot of compassion towards her and I wanted to apologize for the way I acted because she definitely brought out the worst in me. And uh, I pulled my phone out and I was like, I'm just going to send her a text and say, I'm really sorry. And of course I deleted her number. I didn't have it in there, which I'm pretty glad of. But um, I remember realizing that like, I've got to get home because you know my, my wife was pregnant at the time. And it's like, uh, probably, probably she probably needs me now. Uh, but I remember really being so anxious to tell you guys because I hate people that don't follow through, you know, and, and kind of going back to what we said about learning when to quit. It's hard. It's hard. I felt like I was letting everyone down and I was like, oh, you know, we're supposed to do two days. So I'm going to leave. Um, but it, a testament to you and the other guys, everyone was just so cool, you know, and it, it's, it's a real testament to you that um, I remember we we're all outside in a big circle and, and you're kind of supposed to do your own thing and not really bother too many people, but you were going through, you know, the end of your divorce and, people just kept coming up to you. And it was just such beautiful energy with everybody there. And I realized that for me, it wasn't that I needed to do the psychedelics as much as the healing power of nature. And the, I, I think there's something, even if you're in a good relationship, I think there's something about men being around men. And I think that's one of the reasons that I was always drawn to fight sports and that team camaraderie and the same. I love the trading pit. It was 80 to 100 guys stuck in this trading floor just press on top of each other, fight. You're fighting each other for orders, but it builds this, just the closeness of the, just the, the uniqueness of that position. You build this incredibly strength, this, this, this camaraderie. And it's just the same with fighting. It's like the guys you're going to war with in the gym, they're helping you prepare for war outside when you're fighting, not real war, but you know, physical uh, combat sports. And you just build that closeness. It's just so hard to get that in everyday life. And, mm -hmm. and I felt that with you guys. And that was, a you know, most of those guys, I, you know, I'd met like maybe once before some of them I hadn't met at all, but it was a testament to you that, that they all came. You were like the, the mutual uh, link with everybody. So it's just, that's cool. You know, the only it. reason I would go back and do a psychedelic trip again, the only thing, the only reason I don't categorically say I'm done with that is because I just loved hanging out with you guys and, and the ritual of us all going in there and facing our fears and doing it and then sharing afterwards that to me is 
gives me goosebumps now. That was the goal. that was the goal of it all, dude. Like mm-hmm. that was really the that was what it was about for me. You know, like sharing that intense emotional experience as this group, and then yeah, I'll never forget that. I'll never. Mm-hmm. I've still got goosebumps. I'll never forget those experiences. And I and I that's the one little <laughs> out I give myself is like I still want to do that again one one day. You know, like hang with you guys and and have a profound experience. But you know what was so crazy about that, Nick, was before we even took it, I think what people who haven't done it might not understand is the preparation for it where you're changing your diet and you're having... I remember the first time where you, a couple of weeks before you sent me a message and said, you know, are you writing down things you want to think about that you're working through? Like, Are you getting your mind in this place to, to be open to things? Doing all the preparation and even just being in the setting, you're being in the desert, you're seeing the sun go down, the stars are coming out. I felt in a very, very different place. And that goes to show that, you know, you don't even need substances. You, you know, your environment and your mindset does take you to different places. And that's one of the reasons yeah. I, I love to travel is I feel like when I'm at home, I'm so caught up in, I'm very busy and I'm juggling all these different things. And my mind is is never going to go to a beautiful place. Whereas if I go for a week vacation to Hawaii, I'm in this beautiful setting and my son's on the beach and I'm sitting with my wife and I'm just looking out suddenly I'll have these thoughts like I've got to change this in my life. And it's the only time I have to be out of my environment. It's the only time that my mind can go to these beautiful places. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, the, the, and I know you do a lot of that. You go, you go hiking and you, you know, you're, you're with a really good group of friends. And I think that's the key, but when all said and done, the only thing that, it's not the only thing that matters, but it's just the, the people close to you, you know, your friends, your family, the, the people you spend time with, the quality time, that's what's so important. And I really, I got that lesson a lot through you. I remember when you said you were talking about energy on one of your podcasts years ago. And I was always like, ah, it's kind of woo-woo bullshit. And I realized that it's so not true because I was pretty tired before we recorded this. You know, it's a little late in Chicago. I got back from this event. I was working all day. And just when I heard your voice, I smiled. And it was like, because that's, that's the energy you give. And it's the same when you see someone you like that they call you and you're like, oh, I can't wait to talk to this guy. It really is, yeah. life is about energy. And I love what you said about um, Hodges' dad, Mauricio, because I had a beautiful compliment from one of my students at the gym. And he said, he sent me a text and he said, you know, one thing I like about you is that you're always like making people feel good and you're, you're trying to compliment their game. And he said something like, you've obviously got to a place where you don't have to put others down to make yourself feel better. And I, that's not why I do it. But I realized that that's the guy I want to be. I want to be that guy, like you said, like Mauricio, when he comes to the gym and you raise people's spirits, because that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing to be, isn't it? You want to, you are that guy, bro. The guy that the student just told you, you are that guy. (laughs) I I want to keep being that guy. Nick, you're you're such a great guy. I know it's late. I'm i I'm just, this is so beautiful. It's like, that I, I, when I was young, I remember talking to my uncle and I said, you know, I don't believe in celebrating these birthdays, and these events. It's just one day. There's no difference between being 29 and, you know, a day before your 30th birthday and your 30th birthday. And my uncle said, he's like, actually life is about when you look back at your life, it's always about these milestones and these events. And for me, that that's what this conversation is. It's like a little milestone in my, in this podcasting journey of mine. And, you know, hundred episodes, man. yeah, I want, I just, I really hope that, uh, you you continue giving yourself recognition because that's a it's an amazing achievement. I'm going to be honest. When you told me you were starting a podcast, I didn't think you'd you'd get you. I didn't think you'd get to 20 episodes. Not because I don't think that you're someone who follows through. I just didn't realize you were Nick. You're the best. I love you, my man. Thank you so love much. You this has been such a treat. Yeah.